This is Jane Lowe and I'm at Marina Bay Sands uh, today and uh, at the Salesforce uh, World Essentials Tour 2024 here in Singapore. And with me uh, today, I'm very pleased and very privileged to have Gavin Barfield, who is the VP and CTO with Salesforce ASEAN. Thank you so much for your time to today, Gavin. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to speak to you this afternoon, and thank you for coming to join us here at World Tour Essentials. Yeah, so of course, are uh, you going to be sharing with us about AI and trust, uh, uh, some of the highlights from the uh, survey that you have conducted, as well as the highlights of the, some of the keynotes and presentations today. Uh, so, but before we go into AI and trust, you know, just want to get your thoughts about the motivations behind the survey that you conducted on these very two big topics, uh, which, are, which are obviously very uh, uh, catching a lot of attention nowadays. Well, actually, that's right. And what we see is that there's two gaps to the adoption of AI. So the first gap is a trust gap, and the second gap is the value gap. And right from the beginning, Salesforce really focused on making sure that we could bridge that trust gap, because trust is essential to everything that we do. And unless you can trust generative AI, unless you can trust it to do a number of things, unless you can trust it to be accurate, so you want to make sure that, you, that it's accurate in its response, uh, there's no use if it's giving false information. You want to make sure you manage bias and hallucinations. You want to make sure you manage data and privacy. You know, companies spend millions of dollars protecting their information uh, and their customer information, their private information. We want to make sure that we can put, protect that when it's in a uh, generative AI model. And what we, our hypothesis was is trust was really one of those barriers that was a st stopping some of the generative AI adoption. So we commissioned the survey locally to look at some of those issues and look at what's stopping companies progressing further into generative AI and how they feel about trust in general. Um, loss of control is one of the sort of a big topic coming out from the survey. Uh, can you sort of break that down for us in terms of what that means, uh, loss of control? I think some people may think that it's uh, about fairness, you know, of the, um, uh, some of the outputs generated by the AI, it's about uh, explainability, it's about accountability. Can you break that down for us? Yeah, so we have the concept of a human at the helm. Uh, and really, we see AI as being able to supercharge and to complement humans. And we've developed our Office of Ethical AI to make sure when we introduce this AI technology, we do it with accuracy, we do it with trust, we do it in a sustainable way, and we do it with transparency. So the transparency, I think, is important because, you know, you need to be able to, to build that relationship with your customer. And companies spend a lot of time and effort building a trusted relationship with the customer. If you're now going to break that relationship by putting an AI bot in and making that person feel like you're talking to a real person, but in effect you're not, that breaks that trust. So we want to make sure that when we're implementing AI, we're doing it with the human at the helm and the human in control. And AI is really that complementary um, uh, addition and to make sure we're being very transparent to a customer and make sure we're, we're, we're sort of... Um, uh, grounding it in really good quality data so it's accurate. There was also some conversations around, um, you know, raising the awareness and education when it comes to a using AI systems that could hopefully also in improve this uh, sort of uh, sense of loss, well, decrease this sense of loss of control. So there's, uh, I guess there's a need for institutions, for private public uh, organizations to really improve our awareness of uh, an understanding of what AI systems can or cannot do. That's right, and un understand the use cases, where you should be using AI, where you should not be mm -hmm. using AI, and how you can complement the use of AI. But as I said, a lot of it, and I'll pick up from the survey, just you know, reading here, four, four out of 10, so 40%, don't trust the data that AI was built on. Uh, from our survey. So if you don't trust the data, how can you trust the output? If you're a customer service agent and the AI is saying this is what you need to respond to a customer, but you don't trust that that is being used the right information to get that, then you're not going to use it. And, and these are the barriers that, that we are coming across. Being able to do trusted AI with good quality grounded data I think is critically important. And 70% and of those who don't trust AI say it lacks information to be useful. So early sort of studies of AI and early implementations have created very generic responses. And if you go into something like ChatGPT and you ask it to send me a meeting invitation to a customer, it, it does a good job. You know, Dear customer, we'd love to meet you. Please come and discuss our products. But that's not really useful. It's not personal. It's very generic. So in order to create that really usable response, you need to ground that in good quality data. So, you know, dear Gavin, thank you for being a gold card customer. We know you're interested in a home mortgage. You know, would you like to come and meet our customer service available? I know you Saturdays is a better day for you. 
here is your local branch, we can see you at 10. So it's taken that very generic response to being a very specific response because it's been grounded in data. And I think that's where a lot of the challenges of, of generative AI are coming. Everyone got very excited by looking at the ability to create te text, oh, this is good, I can create a really good email. But then when you think about it and use it in, later on, you realize actually, this is not good enough. I need to be able to ground it in good quality data, and I need to be able to try and trust the data. You, you, you need to sort of embed it with a lot more context. Absolutely right. And that's why we talk about it in the flow of work. So I don't think generative AI is going to be an application or a thing that you will use. It will be embedded into all sites, all sorts of applications. So if you're in your word processor and you want to be able to create a letter, you want your generative AI to be there. If you're on your graphics tool and you want to be able to generate a poster or something, you want a picture of a, a frog wearing a green hat, right? You want your generative AI to bring you that picture where you're at. The same is true when you're in your CRM, when you're in Salesforce. You want your AI to be in the flow of work, in sales, in service, in marketing. You want it to have access to that trusted customer data you've got, and you want it to understand, as you said, the context of what you're trying to do, because then it can generate a useful response. You talk about uh, embedding uh, that sense of trust in, in the various uh, use cases and workflows, right? And obviously, uh, people and culture play a, play a big part in sort of this uh, process. Can you talk a, a little bit about the governance uh, transformations, you know, that organizations need to also pay attention to when uh, embarking on this AI journey? And I think you're right, it's a journey, right? This is, not a, this is not a simple thing to be able to roll out, and it requires people to change their mindset and for people to trust the AI and for people to be able to comfort. And going back to the survey, you know, 58, nearly 60% of workers in Singapore fear humans are going to lose control. Um, and that's something that we're very much uh, wanting to prevent. Uh, we really want to make sure that the AI is there and seen as a complementary tool and not as a replacement. And you have to put in those governance layers. You have to do the training. You have to get people to understand where to use AI. Okay. You have to be able to uh, make people understand where that data is coming from, how to check the accuracy of that data. You need to be able to get them to have that trust and faith in, in utilizing AI and see it as a tool that will help them do their job, that will help them give better customer service, that will help them close that sale, and not to see this as a replacement to where they're at. So what do you think is the, some of the major things that organizations can do to you know, help users, help employees, help um, you know, customers see that it is a complementary tool? What is missing at the moment when it comes to education that gives people this sense of fear that it's taking away their jobs? Well, I think the human at the helm is important. So back to the survey, 94% don't trust, uh, currently trust AI to operate without a human intervention. And I think that's important, right? We, I've, I talk to customers who, who say, I want to link up my, my chatbot directly with a large language model. And I say, well, hang on a minute, right? You need to be able to have that human being able to see what the AI is doing, certainly for a while, and being able to be a human at the helm and controlling, controlling the interactions going forward. You also need to make sure that you ground your AI on trusted data. So this morning in the keynote, we talked about the difference between consumer AI and enterprise AI. And in consumer AI, data has come from a variety of different sources. It got scraped from the internet. So some of it's good quality, and as we know, the internet also contains some pretty shocking stuff as well. So all of this has gone into these large language models. What Salesforce is doing is making sure when we use those large language models, we don't utilize the large language models for the data that they're holding. We utilize it for its large language capability, for its ability to generate content, but we ground the prompts in trusted customer data securely to make sure that we get the accuracy around there. So back to the education, people need to understand, and I know you know a lot of what I'm talking about is technical, but people need to be able to understand how the AI is working at this level so that they can get confidence that the data that is coming in is being taken from the right source, that it's accurate, that it's trustworthy. And AI also needs to be use case driven. So, you know, we go through these things with technology all the while that technology comes out and we find a purpose for the technology. And Gen AI hit the scene tremendously quickly. And when you look at it, the benefits are clear. But many companies rushed into it without working out what the use cases that they were trying to do. And as a result, the AI was generated in a way that wasn't really helping the business. I think if you take a use case driven approach and you try to work out what are the best use cases for generative AI, you make sure you go through the adoption with, with your organization on why AI is beneficial. You do the reassurances around, you know, this is not replacing you, this is complementing you. And you make sure that they understand that it's grounded in proper trusted customer data. That will really help AI adoption.
Yeah, it's not so much as uh, forcing a solution into a technology, but rather applying technology to sort of the main business problems that you are facing right now, right? Um, you talked about uh, securing data, and of course, uh, security and privacy is also some of the big elements when it comes to trust in AI. Can you talk a little, and of course, this is a security uh, podcast. Can you talk a little bit about you know, the security and privacy aspects when it comes to trust in AI? Absolutely. I mean, you know, ironically, cu uh, you know, customers and organizations have spent, you know, over the last decades, millions and millions and millions securing customer information, customer confidential company information, firewalls, security processes, passwords, you know, blocked out systems. So we spend a huge amount of money controlling and securing our personal information, our customers' personal information, our company confidential information. Suddenly, these large language models come along from companies that, to be honest, have only been around for a year or so or less or come even a few months. And initially, companies were sort of very much throwing their data across to these models. Uh, and it was you know, almost like the wild, wild west. You were taking these things that you'd spent a lot of money protecting, and suddenly you were pumping it into this large language model somewhere on the internet with the company you didn't really understand, or didn't even understand what you were doing with it. And that's why Salesforce built our trust layer first. Before we rolled out our generative features, we built our trust layer, because trust is our currency. Number one value, and without trust, we don't have a business. So we built our trust layer to do a number of things. Firstly, it masks PII data. So when the data leaves Salesforce, it is masked. Mm. So when it goes across to a large language model, Gavin is replaced with you know, a hash or whatever the algorithm is. Um, and my date of birth or details of whatever it might be, account numbers. So we make sure that doesn't go across to the LLM first. Secondly, we make sure we connect to the LLM for a secure gateway, so we have contracts in place on how we can connect. Thirdly, we Im implement zero retention with our LLM partners. So we're not using the customer's data to help train their model. And we're very clear that customer's data is their data. It's not Salesforce data. It's not our, our LLM partner's data. So we have contractual obligations that they cannot use this data to train their model, that they use it, they generate the re response, and then they forget about it. Uh, and then we do toxicity and bias detection to make sure that when these things come back, we look for hallucinations and bias, and we strip that out or alert customers uh, when there's problems coming back. So there's a whole process around. Um, and, and another point is around how AI has access to data. So traditionally, if you take a bank, right, you don't have a customer service agent, can't see everybody's account. They can't do every process. They, there's access controls on what you can see, what you can't see. At this level, you can see this. At this level, you, can't, you can see that. We want to make sure that we implement those access controls and that data governance with AI as well. So AI can't see everything. We can control the data that AI can see and can't see. And without those sort of trust and that governance and those, those security layers, you really end up taking this new technology, plugging it straight in, giving it access to all the data, access to external solutions, and that's where the security and privacy concerns come in. And we've seen some of this happen. We've seen companies who have employees have used ChatGPT or other tools. They've posted confidential information. And, and you know, I was just saying before the interview, I have a two and a half year old daughter. She's like a large language model. When you say something, she doesn't forget it. You can't get her to forget it. So if I say a bad word, if I'm, if I'm assembling some flat pack furniture and I say something wrong, I can't do that in front of her because I can't delete it and say forget it. It's the same thing with a large language model. Once you've put that stuff out there, you can't retract it. You can't email OpenAI and say, please delete this. The, the AI has learned it. So really being very careful about what data we put outside into these large language models, making sure that it's not confidential, making sure it's not personal identifiable, and making sure it's not part of, of, of AI training. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, sort of our traditional sort of security and privacy principles that we uh, can apply to in this AI era. But there's also obviously new ones, like you just mentioned. Some of this uh, information that we feed into AI models uh, cannot be easily uh, removed um, or, or deleted. So those are some sort of the emerging new principles uh, that we need to also uh, be aware of. I think we can you know, uh, deep dive into this security and privacy aspects of uh, trust and, and trust in AI uh, for a lot longer, but I'm quite conscious about the time. So, but, uh, so uh, maybe uh, for next time, uh, we can uh, take stock of uh, where we are a year from now uh, in terms of where, uh, how far we have come in measuring and you know, observing improvements in, AI, uh, in, in trust in AI. Yes, uh, I think so. I think we're back in a year. I think things will be very different. Uh, 
Firstly, I think if we look back in a year, we'll see a, a, a wide range of LLMs available. So Salesforce is building this open ecosystem so that you can plug in any large language model. In the next year, I think we'll see very industry-specific or country-specific models that are, that are fine-tuned on quality data sets that solve business problems in a, as opposed to using very broad, large language models trained on public data. They will still exist, but what we will be able to do is use different things for different purposes, and that's why Salesforce has built us through an open ecosystem. So we'll see that. I think the security uh, and the privacy and the trusting that you've touched on will not go away, and we'll carry on making sure that we're investing heavily to do this thing within this envelope of trust. And, and as I said, that was our first principle. We have to make sure that we do this in a trustworthy way where we help companies protect their uh, data and we help them do that with trust. And, and our survey is proving that without this trust, the technology might be great, but if you haven't got the trust, then people won't adopt it and you won't hit that, that value gap. And then also doing this really inside the flow of work. So making sure that your AI becomes, and that's why we, you know, you know, we call it co-pilot, your assistant that is sitting there understanding what you're doing, has access to really great data, can retrieve that data securely, can use large language models safely, and can become your co-pilot, your assistant, to boost productivity. That's right, using AI as a co-pilot to bridge that value gap, isn't it? Yeah, so... That's right. Yeah, so thank you so much for your time today, Gavin. Thank you so much, it's been a real pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.